Good morning. Thank you so much uh, for having our contingent uh, from BST here this morning. We're genuinely grateful for it. And I must say I feel uh, rather comfortable here since it seems like all of your pastors were trained at BST. So something like that. Now, I'm much more excited to be here because Mission Exposure Week for us is an opportunity to partner with the mission that Oasis and Genesis and the various chaplaincies that we'll be involved in are already at work in uh, in the world. And so it's a great privilege uh, to partner with you in that. And because it is Mission Exposure uh, Week for us, and it always benefits us to think once again about mission, I do want to ask this question, what is mission, and especially how we are meant to go about it? So first, what is mission? Now, the word connotes various things, doesn't it? We can think of spy missions or military missions, Mission Impossible. Uh, We can think about corporate mission, or we can think about diplomatic missions. And at their root, and my students who are in your class uh, will tell you that this is an occupational hazard. I'm a, a student of the early church, and so I will always mention something about Latin or Greek and something about church history. So just buckle up, everyone. The mission, the word mission, refers to ascending, right? And when we think of God's mission, it refers to him sending, first of all, his son, and then his people into the world. And this mission has an end, it has a goal, and that goal is to reconcile all things to himself. That goal is to be in a world at the end of the age when every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so God sends his son and then he sends his church out such that the world might be drawn back to him. Now it's a privilege that God uses us today here for mission. He sends the 12 out, but he also sends us out to draw people into his love. And so as we think about how uh, we ought to do mission, I thought that it was uh, a good idea to turn to Jesus' words about how we ought to do mission. And so we read this morning a section of what's often referred to as Jesus' missionary discourse. What a passage this is here finally. We have some straightforward instructions about how we're meant to go about mission. Great. At least this is how some people in the history of the church have taken this passage. The most famous uh, of these is probably Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi is known uh, for several things. For example, he's known for his spirituality, which exudes thankfulness for all creatures. And so you might be familiar with the hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. It's based on a poem that Francis wrote. He's also famous because he was intent in his age in the 13th century on living an evangelical life, a gospel life. And this meant several things for him. It meant truly attending to the commands of Christ as presented in the gospels. It also meant spreading the gospel far and wide. And so he and his followers, the Franciscans, were among uh, an early group of very influential missionaries uh, around the world. And it's along these lines, along this evangelical life that Francis was called to lead that we hear from his medieval biographer, his 13th century biographer. And I'm gonna quote from this now. One day that gospel was read aloud in which Christ gave to his disciples the gospel pattern for their life that they were sent forth to preach. That is Matthew 10. Hearing this and understanding it and committing it to memory, Francis was at once filled with unspeakable joy This, he said, is what I desire. Truly, this is what I long for with my whole heart. Then he took off his shoes. No, I'm not going to take off my shoes. Then he took off his shoes. He laid down his staff. He cast aside his purse and his money, contented him with one mere tunic, and throwing aside his belt, took a rope for girdle, applying all the care of his heart to discover how he might best fulfill what he had heard and conform himself in all things to the rule of the godliness of the apostles. From this time forward, the man of God began by divine impulse to, begin as, to become a zealous imitator of gospel poverty and to invite others to repentance. 
So it happened that Francis brought tidings of peace and preached salvation, and by helpful exhortations united many to the true peace, who were previously at enmity with Christ and far from salvation. Go and do likewise. Or maybe not. Your pastors uh, are regretting inviting me to preach this morning. No, in fact, it's not at all obvious, is it, that this passage gives us straightforward uh, directions on how to conduct mission in our age, is it? It's clearly and directly speaking to the 12, just listed before Jesus speaks. And it's apparently speaking to them about a mission that's to take place during Jesus' lifetime. After all, here Jesus says, do not go among the nations. Whereas much more famously in the Great Commission, at the very end of the gospel, when Jesus is raised, he says to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And so many interpreters, including many prominent reformers in your own tradition here at Oasis, have therefore judged that the commands that Jesus gives are temporary. They do not apply to mission after the resurrection. But if we're convinced with the Gospel of Matthew that none of Jesus' words will pass away, then what do these words have to speak to us for mission today? Do they apply to us? I'm convinced they are. If so, then how do they apply to us? This is in part what we'll attempt to answer this morning as we also consider what mission is or what the mission of God is. So to proceed, how I'll conclude somewhat, Even if some of these commands are undoubtedly temporary, they nevertheless continue to serve as promises to all who stand in the tradition of the Twelve, and that includes Christians in the room even today. In this passage, Jesus demonstrates that he goes with his disciples, with us on the way, in our own mission, however different that mission may look uh, from the mission of the Twelve and from mission in the 13th century. Like the apostles, by virtue of our one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we have a share in Christ. We're given a share in his authority. We are irrevocably bound together with him because he has bound himself together with us. And so as we go forth in mission, we continue to be bound to him and we continue to serve him as people united to our risen Lord. So first, in the remainder of this sermon, we'll take a look at Christ's union with his disciples and with us in mission. And then second, we'll see how this union uh, with us must shape our mission. So first on Christ's presence with us. The Gospel of Matthew is famously the Gospel of God with us. Let's think back or forward. We're actually closer to Christmas uh, 2024 than to Christmas 2023. So if we think forward to Christmas, start buying presents. No, if we think forward to Christmas, uh, we see that in the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, with the angel announcing to Joseph the birth of the Jesus, this, chapter 1, verses 22 to 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In this very first instance, from almost the very first letter of the gospel, God's most intimate presence among his people is seen in the incarnation, in the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Before the coming of the Spirit, before Jesus ascended on high, before he was raised, before he was crucified, all for us and for our our salvation, the good news at this point for the disciples and for those in Israel in the first century was that God had become flesh and dwelt among them. He did so to unite this people of flesh and blood to himself. In the person of Jesus Christ, in the midst of these 12 disciples and any who came in contact with him, he entered into intimate fellowship with them. He offered the gift through faith of intimate fellowship and communion with himself. That is, communion with God himself. So this is the beginning of the good news, the incarnation. The beginning of God with us. No less famous than this, perhaps, is Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. And finally, at the end of the Great Commission, in the very last verse of the Gospel of Matthew... Chapter 28, verse 20, 
And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Now, in this last instance, this is a statement about the presence, about the union that God has with us through the giving of the Holy Spirit. So from the incarnation of the Son to the giving of the Holy Spirit, the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of God with us. The good news in the Gospel of Matthew is that God has come near us, and that therefore his kingdom has come near to us. God the Son has connected his fate so inextricably from ours that as we die, so he has chosen to die. And that as he is raised, so he raises us up. So it's because Jesus makes himself present, that he is with us, that God is with us, that he then also goes with us in mission. Where do we see this in today's passage. Well, look with me to the very early verses in the passage. First, chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And after this, Matthew then lists the 12, of course. Jesus begins to speak and instructs them to do these same things a few verses on, verses 7 to 8. And proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. So in these verses, Jesus is indicating to his disciples, not only is he present with them, but he gives something of himself to them. He gives them his authority and commands them to do as he does. This is no mere imitation. Yes, we are to imitate Christ in his mission. But Christ is united to us and has united himself to us by giving us his authority. And so, he gives us a share of himself in mission. His instructions for mission and his gifts of authority are preceded and depend on the gift of himself to his disciples. In other words, when we are on mission, Jesus himself and his authority go along with us. We're not sent out without him. He comes along on the way and empowers us in mission. Let's see then how united are the ministries of Jesus and the disciples in this passage. Turning to the discourse itself. The discourse starts in a startling way, as I've already mentioned, verses 5 and 6. Do not go among the Gentiles, among the nations, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep, of Israel. Now, although we haven't just heard this, we need to recall that Matthew has just said at the end of chapter 9, this, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Who is this crowd but the lost sheep of Israel? More pointedly still, later in the gospel, in chapter 15, verse 24, Jesus says this to a non-Israelite woman. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So note that the mission of the twelve, as Jesus commands it to be done, is identical to how Jesus defines his own mission. The way that Jesus commands and thus defines the ministry of the twelve is identical to how he sees his own ministry. What does this indicate? It indicates his unity with the disciples. God himself goes with the disciples on the way, in their mission. Verses 7 to 8. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Again, the way that Jesus is speaking about the ministry of the twelve is precisely the way that Jesus' ministry is described throughout the gospel and the way that Jesus describes his own ministry in the gospel. So again, just before this passage, before chapter 10, at the end of chapter 9, we hear this from Matthew. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. This is a recurring summary of Jesus' ministry in the gospel. Just after the speech again, Jesus sends this message by way of uh, John the Baptist's disciples to John the Baptist. 
Chapter 11, verse 5. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And earlier in the same gospel, once again, chapter 4, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The point here, the way that Jesus commands the twelve to, to go about mission is identical to the way that Jesus goes about mission. As Jesus commands the disciples to do as he does, he does so as one who is in solidarity with his disciples, as one who graciously gives himself and his authority to the disciples. So in their mission, God goes along with them. The ministry of the Twelve, this is to put it too strongly, you may chastise me later, the ministry of the Twelve, and therefore our ministry, is therefore no less than the ministry of Jesus himself, at least in Jesus' understanding. This is what Jesus means when he says, freely you have received, freely give. Jesus, this God become flesh, has fully given himself to his disciples, has given his authority to his disciples, and has done so that they and that we might freely and generously give ourselves and thus give Christ to others. We can only give Christ to others, we can only bear Christ to others because Christ has first given himself to us, not once, And then did he leave? But he has given us continually his spirit to guarantee his presence with us in our lives and in our missions. Now let's turn to how the commands of Jesus and how his solidarity, his union with us ought to shape the way that we go about mission. First chapter 10, verses nine, sorry, chapter 10, verses nine to 10. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. I'm not going to spend time uh, defending Francis's uh, interpretation. It's very literalistic interpretation of this passage. However, I will strongly encourage you uh, to listen to Francis and especially to Christ It is imperative on simplicity of life and mission. What Francis calls gospel poverty, we'll call gospel simplicity. Living simply, living perhaps, if you have means, well below your means. Now, simplicity will naturally look different in our modern age than it did in the first century or in the 13th century. However, whatever form it takes, simplicity is a recognition of two facts. First, it's a recognition of our utter reliance on Christ and Christ's work. It's only because Christ has come down and come near to us and graciously given to himself, uh, himself to us that we've received anything and therefore can give anything. Second, gospel simplicity is a recognition of the fact that as much as Christ has deigned to be with us and work in and through us, what a privilege, we simply are weak and limited. We simply are sinful. We are poor and needy. So to live simply is to recognize these facts. Now let me say something controversial. We don't know one another. And I'll I'll let you consider how this can speak to your own conscience. Not only is there no point looking fancy, looking wealthy, looking important, looking cool, Don't worry, I don't ever have that last problem. But to seek to do anything else uh, other than to live simply and to portray Christ through that simplicity, to put on a spectacle, say, is in fact a denial both of the God who calls us in Christ and of who we are in Christ. So a recognition of our own weakness and our reliance on God's gracious work through simple living is essential to a ministry that's in solidarity with our Lord. Next, verses 11 to 15. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. 
If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Now, these are difficult sayings. They're difficult both for how to interpret them, and they're difficult because they do strike fear into the heart. When I say they strike fear into the heart, I'm speaking less about the mention of the day of judgment, though perhaps that should, for uh, many of us, strike fear into our hearts. But what I'm really referring to is the idea that the Christian, you and I, the one who stands in line of the 12, is told that he or she holds responsibility over God's peace being given and removed. If we're received, peace is given. If we're rejected, destruction ensues. But how could I, having already established how weak and sinful I am, bear the weight of this responsibility? It is, or at least it ought to be, terrifying to us. But this isn't really the point of the passage, is it? Jesus has commanded the twelve to do exactly as he does. Gives them a share in himself and gives them a share in his authority. So insofar as they bear Christ, they bring the opportunity for the acceptance or rejection, not of themselves, but of Christ. It's precisely because God has graciously given himself to the apostles and to us that the acceptance or rejection of us is, in Christ's terms here, really an acceptance or rejection of Jesus. As Jesus commands the disciples, a rejection of them is actually a rejection of Christ. And this, the judgment, the true and the merciful and the loving and the fair judgment of Christ is a solid basis uh, for judgment. Not my own, but Christ's. These words do, though, stand as a warning to us in our mission and in our lives. And when I speak of mission, I speak not only of what happens here in the church, what happens amongst uh, evangelistic uh, events. I mean how we bear Christ to our family members and to our friends and to our neighbors. When we come to them, do we truly bear Christ to these individuals and communities to whom we bring the gospel and to whom we've been entrusted? Are we truly living and speaking Christ? Christ has given himself to us generously. Are we generously giving Christ to others? Are we giving in the same way that we've so generously received? Again, we fall back on our utter reliance upon the power and the grace of Christ for salvation. If our mission is not utterly dependent on him, on the living and reigning divine king, then we're rudderless. We're dead in the water. But thanks be to God who has given so freely of himself in coming and in sending his spirit to us. So to conclude, I draw attention once more to the contrast I brought up at the beginning. In the opening of his speech, Jesus commands the 12, do not go among the nations. While in the Great Commission, he commands precisely the opposite, go and make disciples of all nations. Given this stark contrast, are the instructions to the 12 something temporary, while the Great Commission lasts till the very end of the age? Well, clearly some of the geographical and ethnic restrictions, such as go only to the lost sheep of Israel, and instructions say around gold and copper and silver. I don't think the Australian, no, never mind. uh, Are clearly temporary. They're but one episode in God's longer plan of redeeming the world, of drawing all things uh, to himself, of reconciling the world to himself. However, the precepts that underline these commands endure. They continue to speak to us today. In our own mission, God, by his spirit, goes with us. This is no abstract presence, friends. This is God's power for salvation. God gives himself to his disciples. He gives himself to us. He endues us with authority. He empowers us for mission God's grace has overflowed in our lives, and we must respond to the call. And so, to receive Christ, we must also bear him simply and humbly to others. And thanks be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who work so mightily and help so lovingly in this task.
Let's pray. O oh Lord, freely we have received. Let us freely give. You come among us. Your grace is more than we can ask or imagine. We stand in awe of you. O oh Lord, as we stand in awe of you and of your goodness and your grace, lead us to turn from evil and towards your face. Help us to follow you in your ministry and to bear your likeness to all those around us. All for your son's sake. Amen. Please stand. Now, as you're sent out uh, with this blessing and with this song on mission, on the mission that God comes among you to do and empowers you to do, receive this blessing from Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who intercedes on our behalf with the Father. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up the light of his face upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. <laughs>